Will it cannon? That is the question. Hello, Watchtower Database. Thanks to Maddie for making that a thing. Welcome to a new segment we're calling Will It Cannon? Oh, sorry, I read that wrong. Welcome to a new segment we're, we're calling Will It Cannon? Question mark. I tried to buy a lab coat to make this more authentic, but you know, I couldn't, I didn't find one. This isn't a Starbucks apron. Whatever you were thinking is the wrong thinking. Maybe next time I'll have a lab coat, patreon.com slash DCAU Watchtower. In this show, we're gonna be going through some DC Comics properties that have been arguably connected to the 90s DC animated universe over the course of their existence and pass judgment like the 12th level intellects we are. Self-proclaimed trademark symbol. But first, how do we determine what is canon and what is not canon in the most basic terms. Sh I'm not wearing the goggles. With TV shows, movies, comics, video games, books, all sorts of other stuff in this universe, how does one determine which Donald Trump's the others? To be as unbiased and objective as possible when determining whether something is canon to the DC animated universe, we need to set ourselves some guidelines. Quite simply, the first tier of canonicity would be animated properties. Backed up by this quote from Bruce Tim, stating his canon inclusive definition of on screen substance first and foremost. This includes the animated series, uh, their movies, companions, and any screenplay or novelization adaptations of those things. The next rungs down would be the DCAU tie-in comics, followed by production team statements, then video games and books, official guides, and finally everything else, with the running theme of innocent until proven guilty when it comes to each tier's validity. If you'd like a closer look at how we came to the conclusion of this order, you can find a document linked in the description of this video. We'll be touching on each tier individually as we go through other questionably canon DCAU material. As you can see, the DC Animated Universe is quite vast. This saga of DC Comics cartoons is regarded by many to be some of the most groundbreaking and well-executed animation in television history. With its Emmy award-winning writing, iconic voice cast, and unique art style, it is revolutionary. It is everlasting. It is sensational. So now, on an unrelated topic, let's talk about Superman Brainiac Attacks. While Batman the Animated Series was a spiritual successor to Tim Burton's Batman and Batman Returns, incorporating many of the Burton versus characteristics, tone, design, and music, the show began to take on a life of its own and quite quickly separated itself from Burton's movies in delightfully unexpected ways. But it was no secret that DC and Warner Brothers were originally capitalizing off the success and popularity of these Batman films, and it's not uncommon to see this same pattern in cinema and television today. While WB struggled to get another Batman motion picture off the ground, the animated series skyrocketed in ratings, accolades, and fan appreciation. For many, this cartoon and its accompanying feature, Mask of the Phantasm, became the definitive version of Batman. So when the next live-action films finally arrived, with their flashy, colorful, neon circus nightmare presentation, they left something to be desired. Director Joel Schumacher stated his intention with his Batman films was to evoke the qualities of a cartoon, while, ironically, Batman the Animated Series and its sequel, The New Batman Adventures, continued to hold the attention and commitment of its audience, young and old, by maintaining a darker, more grounded approach to The Dark Knight. It wouldn't be until 2005 that we would get another Batman film in the form of Batman Begins, the launch pad of Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy. During that eight-year gap, the DC Animated Universe saw the introduction and wrap-up of Superman the Animated Series, as well as the entirety of Batman Beyond, Static Shock, The Zeta Project, Justice League, and most of Justice League Unlimited. The film and animation landscape had completely changed. No longer would an over-the-top campy Batman work on screen, and the big boys upstairs knew it. So why the next thing happened, I'm not sure I'll ever understand. Sometime during the airing of Justice League Unlimited's final season, Warner Brothers Animation began production on a new direct-to-video Superman film. The upcoming sort of reboot, but sort of not, live-action movie Superman Returns was set to hit theaters in June of 2006, and as is tradition because they did it once, the animation side of things jumped at the opportunity to make an understandably easy buck. Back in 1997, when Batman and Robin received negative reviews nationwide, the DCAU team held back on their simultaneous release of Batman and Mr. Freeze Sub-Zero, for fear that another Mr. Freeze-centric Batman film might not do so well after Schwarzenegger's 
interesting take on the character. They did so, I can only imagine, as respect to their work and to their budding franchise. And while Superman Returns was met with mixed reactions from critics and fans alike, it didn't do poorly enough to warrant a cancellation of its animated companion's distribution. The same month as Returns premiered in theaters, along came Brainiac Attacks. So what is Brainiac Attacks? Well, it's an animated Superman movie. It stars Tim Daly, Dana Delaney, and other returning Superman the Animated Series voice actors in their old roles. It's also drawn in the same iconic Bruce Tim art style as the cartoon. So with these very obvious similarities, it's gotta be a continuation of that show, right? Referring to our tier of canonicity, we do have animated properties listed first, as they are naturally the origin of the DCAU and should be treated as automatic canon, so to speak. However, I have to point out that there are a lot of animated shows and movies that have been argued as part of the DCAU over the years, despite having many questionable aspects to them. So with that in mind, how does this particular animated property hold up? Well. It's sort of like an estranged stepbrother to the DCAU. But why? What exactly warrants this movie receiving that kind of categorization? First off, we can turn to this interview with the film's writer, Dwayne Capizzi. Capizzi spoke with the world's finest Jim Harvey in 2006 about the movie's ins and outs, including this little tidbit here. For the diehard fans of STAS, presumably the bulk of your readership, let me first say that the movie is not intended to be in continuity with the Timverse, despite utilizing those character and background designs. This right here should be enough to give you closure, but why don't we take a look at some of Brainiac Attacks' more glaring issues to see just why this film be what it be. First off, the most obvious crimes. Despite bringing back Superman voice actor Tim Daly and Lois Lane actress Dana Delaney, the film drops the ball when it comes to its villains. Rather than Clancy Brown, the usual voice for Lex Luthor, Brainiac Attacks employs the late Powers Booth. Care for an object lesson? Up, up, and away! And for Brainiac, we get Lance Henriksen as a replacement for Corey Burton. What brings you so far from your adopted home? I think I shall help myself. Now I want to take a second to point out that these changes alone don't make or break the movie's rightful place in the DC animated universe. I mean, we just got an all-new Harley and an all-new Ivy, and there's not enough weirdness in that film to keep it out of the DCAU proper. I cannot stress this enough. Batman and Harley Quinn is in the DCAU. Stop telling us it's not because you are absolutely incorrect. This is just fact. I'm sorry if you don't like the movie, but that does not change anything. So I suggest you get over it. It's the changes in personality that make Luthor and Brainiac so awkward in this movie. Capizzi notes that the depiction of Lex Luthor was intentionally modeled after Gene Hackman's performance in the Donner films to dovetail with Luthor's depiction in the upcoming Brian Singer film. The Lex we see in this movie is pretty much an entirely different person than we've known him to be in his prior appearances. He's giddy, he's clumsy, he's much more of a, well, Jesse Eisenberg than a Clancy Brown. Not to mention that at the time, the last time we saw Lex in our lives was in the series finale of JLU, where he sacrifices himself to save humanity, all while boasting that usual cheeky Lex half-smile. That Lex Luthor doesn't seem like the kind of guy to sit in his car and giggle like a schoolgirl. This whole Lex thing is made doubly weird when you consider that his new voice actor is the same guy who voiced Gorilla Grodd in the Justice League cartoons, who we last saw punching Luthor in the face and being blown into space. Now he's kryptonite rambling all over the place. It confuses my widow brain, okay? <clears throat> Let's hop back to Brainiac. Honestly, Lance Henriksen is an awesome choice for the character in any other movie. Henriksen famously played the android Bishop in the movie Aliens and was in the first Terminator movie, so having his voice accompany a robot is actually pretty perfect. But his character now comes equipped with similar personality peculiarities to Luthor. He doesn't speak in the same rhythm, he doesn't seem to have the same motivations, the guy even smiles now. I think DCAU Brainiac did that once, maybe. Now, sure, this is a bit opinionated. I mean, who are we to say what a character should or shouldn't act like? That's not up to us. It's up to Bruce Tim and, and whoever, I'm gonna eat this now, whoever else makes these things. We don't, we don't make, I make some of this stuff, but it's not official. You can go to legacydcau.com to see more. So let's see if there's anything in Brainiac Attacks that literally does not work in the greater context of the DCAU. For starters, the LexCorp building looks very different than how we've seen it in the animated series. Now, sure, you might say, Well, that's just a different LexCorp building. After all, Lex supposedly owns most of Metropolis. But this is the same interior office Lex always had, so... 
your move. We also have a very different looking Phantom Zone than the reddish hellscape we've seen previously. While it could be argued this is just how we see the Phantom Zone through the projector, and it always looks like this if you're inside it, which is kind of backed up by its later appearance in the Earth-12 Beyond comics, it's still pretty striking, and characters seem to be able to move about freely, unlike Jaxer, Mala, or even past Superman who seem to be more or less frozen in place, scared and alone in a weird nightmare void. Plus, Superman and the Fortress of Solitude's knowledge orb speak as if Superman has never been to the Phantom Zone. Though the Phantom Zone is prison to the most dangerous criminals in all the galaxies, they will not present the greatest threat to you within it. The longer you remain in the zone, the more vulnerable you will be to its effects. And let's talk about the Fortress. While it's similar to the version we saw in STAS, JLU, and Batman Beyond, we've never seen this particular area before. Sure, in For the Man Who Has Everything, we learn there's actually several previously unrevealed sections of the Fortress, but this one in the Brainiac movie seems superfluous, as Superman already has a chamber for accessing the Knowledge Orb, and it's not this place. The Knowledge Orb itself displays Superman's symbol when he accesses its database, unlike in STAS when we see it's the orb's connection to Superman's Kryptonian tablet that does the DNA scanning stuff. And Brainiac later seems fascinated with the orb, even though if this is in the DCAU, he made the thing. Not to mention, the Fortress of Solitude f***ing explodes in this movie. And while yes, Superman finds the last sliver of it promising, I'll rebuild it at the end. What about all the animals, dude? And the orb. The orb was like all of Krypton. The orb isn't part of the fortress. Ah! So what else is there? Well, there's quite a few little things sprinkled about. Mercy has blonde hair for no reason. Superman uses freeze breath, which is something we've never actually seen him do in the DCAU before, I think. And a plethora of characters call each other different names than we've ever heard used before. Jimmy calls Clark Mr. K instead of just Clark the way he did throughout the series. Mercy calls Lex Mr. Luthor instead of just Lex, which makes her seem much more subservient than she ever has been. Mr. L? Mercy? And Brainiac repeatedly calls Superman Son of Krypton instead of Son of Jor-El or even Kal-El, which is especially weird considering he too is technically a Son of Krypton. The biggest question this movie raises is, where in time would it take place in relation to every other DCAU property? Now, hey, don't, don't go running off. Yes, this is becoming a timeline video, but only for a little bit, okay? Jeez, it's like you guys don't even like us anymore. All right, if Luthor is still in businessman mode, then this must take place before Justice League, AKA before he succumbs to kryptonite poisoning. So much for your image as the benevolent businessman. This is the end of an era. However, Luthor shows off a small sliver of kryptonite and is depressed that that's all he has, when surely he should have more. If this is before Justice League, shouldn't he have this chunk he's supposedly been carrying around for years? Remember that chunk of kryptonite you carried around for years? And speaking of years... I spent two years and three billion dollars mining outer space, and this green grain of rice is all I have to show for it? From what we've been able to gather on the timeline of Superman the Animated Series, the show begins sometime in the DCAU's late 19th 1996 to early 1997, not long after the Sub-Zero movie. During this same time period is when Lex Luthor first comes into possession of Kryptonite and uses it against Superman in the episode A Little Piece of Home. Two years after that episode, we'd be in late 1998 to early 1999, around the time of Hand of Fate and Bizarro's world. But hold that thought for a moment. Let's look at Brainiac in relation to the timeline. In this movie, Brainiac seems to not be a new thing. Superman knows who he is, even Perry White does. So we can rule out this being his chronological debut appearance. But in his debut in the STAS episode Stolen Memories, Lex Luthor is pretty much the first human Brainiac lays robotic eyes on. And yet... And Lex Luthor gave him sight. Lex Luthor. In the flesh. I know of you through my... Uh... Acquisition of knowledge through my patented Lex Lab supercomputer, yada yada yada. Your tone conveys a familiarity that has not yet been earned, Lex Luthor. So... Huh? Have they met or not? Lex's dialogue in this scene is just vague enough to suggest perhaps he personally has met Brainiac, but not the other way around, meaning that this could be a new Brainiac, one who just hasn't met Lex yet. Like, you know, one of these duplicate drones sent out across the cosmos by the big cheese grand Poobah Brainiac in his head asteroid thing. I mean, we have no idea how long that big rock's been floating around out there, so it's not impossible. However, this Brainiac that we find out in Divided We Fall has been living dormant inside Luthor's cells for years, 
Harris knew all about Darkseid, and even refers to that double-crossing confrontation as his own. I have learned from my encounter with Darkseid that organic beings cannot be trusted. That's a thing that happened while he was still in Lex Luthor. He, was, he wasn't actually there that one. He was... Oh. So it's safe to say that despite there being an unknown quantity of Brainiac bots floating around space, they all seem to be connected to the same Brainiac Wi-Fi, as it were, and therefore this Brainiac in the movie should know about Lex regardless. And back to the Doctor Fate and Bizarro episodes, if this movie takes place around the same time as those, despite all this, Superman and or Lex have encountered Brainiac three times at least already, all of which follow up pretty back to back. So it's either this is the first time Brainiac and Lex are meeting, or this is. But it can't be both. Additionally, Perry White says, If he's gonna cripple Metropolis by crashing all our computers like last time! But we've never seen him do this? There are other minor discrepancies throughout, like the mayor being an elderly woman instead of this man we see in Speed Demons, but what it all comes down to is... What I, what I said near the start, this movie was never intended to be part of the DCAU or Superman the Animated Series, and intentions are not, even though most of the things laid out in this video could be worked around if you really wanted it to be part of this universe for some reason. Except the Brainiac debut thing, I'd like to see you try. This movie is simply meant as a kid-friendly tie-in to Superman Returns, and really, nothing more. So, will it canon? Let's find out. Well, there you have it. Superman Brainiac Attacks, not canon. Does that mean you can't enjoy it? Of course not. People have a weird way of defining canon as good and not canon as bad. Even if all it is is they just don't like the movie. But it's great seeing these Superman the Animated Series characters in Blu-ray quality. I mean, come on, it's not a terrible movie. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everyone. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can head over to our Patreon at the link in the description below. If you'd like more Brainiac Attacks, we also did a commentary a little while back that, uh, <clears throat> it's something. It's a little, it's interesting. Um, if you want, uh, you can find that in the description, too. Subscribe and stuff. Bye!